It is just before noon Eastern on Tuesday, March 2nd. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to log on and say hello. Many of you know that as we do our YouTube live events, we love just getting a couple of minutes for everyone to relax. You may have had a, a busy morning if you're on an East Coast or maybe if you're on the West Coast or somewhere else in the world because we do know oh, we have our international friends as well. Who knows what time it is for you, but we'll take a deep breath. We'll get ready for some great learning. Uh, very quick introduction as we're just kind of hanging out. My name is Garrett Paxinger. I'm the co-founder of Vecrol along with Justine. I'm a critical care specialist. I am just outside of Philadelphia. As I look out my window, thankfully, some of this snow is melting and it's finally sunny, a little bit windy. What about you, Justine? I am Justine Lee. I'm an emergency critical care specialist and toxicologist, and I practice in St. Paul, Minnesota, where it is a balmy, awesome 32 degrees and sunny. <laughs> uh, we've been super, super cold, so I'm actually wearing shorts underneath this shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Dr. Scott Stevenson with us. Dr. Stevenson, where are you logging in from today? So I'm in a little town called Gananoque, Ontario, Canada, uh, just on the east end of Lake Ontario, about a, a mile and a half from upstate New York um, in the most endemic area for Lyme disease in Canada. I'm very excited to be here today. We are much colder today. We've had some warmer spring weather, but it is freezing right now. So, uh, so enjoying being inside today. So thank you again. So we have three cold weather people. So I would love to know, make us jealous. If you are in a warm weather environment, one of our colleagues was talking to us from Tampa, Florida yesterday. And he's like, yeah, I'm in my beach house and uh, we're gonna go swimming later. And, you know, Justine and I are, you know, layers and fireplace on and, you know, heat's on and, you know, don't wanna go outside. The dogs are peeing inside because they don't wanna go in the snow anymore. So we were jealous. So if you are somewhere warm, let us know. If you're somewhere cold and you want to empathize or sympathize with us, let us know. So type in that chat window where you are logging in from around the world. We love to see all of you and, and enjoy where you are. And we thank you for spending just a little bit of time with us. It's just after noon now. So I'm going to go ahead and get the, the party today started with our introduction. We're here today, YouTube Live, race-approved YouTube Live event, talking about combating Lyme disease in practice tip from the trenches. We already met our speaker. We'll meet him a little bit more with an intro later, but super excited. We've had Dr. Stevenson here with us before. A lot of information. So thanks for joining us and let's get this party started with some of our information. As many of you know, when we've had the, the fortune of, of a wonderful educational partner, today's educational partner is Merck Animal Health. We want to thank them for, for providing us the opportunity to give this race-approved CE free to the veterinary community, the veterinary world. So again, thank you to Merck Animal Health for being an amazing educational partner to VetGirl. If this is your first VetGirl event, what you're gonna quickly notice is that number one, we are the number one CE provider for busy veterinary professionals. We provide clinically relevant, practical, cost-effective CE in a multimedia approach. Today is a YouTube live event. We have traditional webinars, which are usually in the evening real life rounds, podcasts, videos, blogs, and much, much more. We have a discussion board, a certificate program, and everything is at a cost-effective price, and you get everything as a Vecral member. So please check out our website. If you're not a Vecral member yet, great way to stay up to date on your CE and learn on your time 24-7, 365, whether you're walking the dog, commuting to work, uh, maybe taking a vacation once COVID is over, right? Stick those AirPods in and Listen, learn on your time. So we hope you enjoy today's session and our multimedia approach to doing that. Talk about our Vecral form. It's a great way. I know the other day I was talking to a friend and I miss interaction. Well, I get to interact with some of my colleagues on the Vecral discussion board, get clinical consults, some case support, maybe speak to a specialist, job postings. So a great way. If you're a Vecral member, make sure you check out our discussion forum boards. And as you know, this is a social media event. We are broadcasting live on YouTube. We hope you're interacting with us on any social media platform. If it's a common social media platform, we're on there. Whether you like us on Facebook, tweet with us on Twitter, gram with us on Instagram, hang out with us on LinkedIn, just interact with us. We absolutely love the opportunity and it's a great way to stay up to date on what we're doing each and every day. Now, this is super important. As I said multiple times, this is a live, interactive, race approved event. Race standards have changed, so this is what you need to do to get your race approved CE. 
As you see on your screen, I'm looking for my phone right now, I have a big QR code listed there. If you put your phone directly up to that QR code, your camera right there, your phone is gonna recognize that's a QR code. And if I turn my phone around, you can see it right up top here. My phone automatically knows if I click on that, it's gonna bring up the form. There it is, okay? So it brings up the form right away where you'll fill out that form and go ahead to get CE credit. Now, if you don't have a smartphone, I know Justine typed it into the question screener, that URL on the browser, if you type that into your browser, that same form pops up. So please make sure to fill out that form. If you're licensed in multiple states, you can absolutely fill out that form more than once to include your state and license number. Please make sure to do that. We will keep this form open until about 1, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, about 30 minutes after the live session. So if it ends at 12.30 Eastern or 12.40 Eastern, we will extend it 30 more minutes for you to fill out that form. And then later today, we'll send out CE certificates to those that filled out the form before it closed again, 30 minutes leeway after the event ends. So we'll make sure to remind you and the QR phone, uh, QR code, that little image will appear on multiple slides. And Justine, again, will place that in the question screener. Now, if you're on YouTube, just so you do know, I know sometimes it shows up with that small screen, but I have a little arrow there. The bottom right of our, your YouTube screen looks like a little box. If you click on that, that'll become the full screen of your desktop so you can make sure you can see everything very clearly. So if you want a full screen, the option exists right within YouTube. With that said, I know you're not here to my here to listen to myself or Justine. I know you like talking to us and we love talking to you, but we're here to listen to Dr. Scott Stevenson. Again, I've had the pleasure, we've had the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Stevenson prior, a lot of awesome information. In a second, I'm going to mute myself and Justine, and we're going to go away. We're going to be behind the scenes. Dr. Stevenson, if you can start by just giving us a little bit more introduction, what kind of medicine do you love practicing? I know you said you're just outside of New York, and any fun facts about yourself, and then please take it away. The floor will be yours, and Justine and I will be behind the scenes again. Thank you so much for doing this. Awesome. All right, thank you very much, guys. Um, so yeah, I am I am a general practitioner. I'm actually coming live to you today from uh, from one of my exam rooms. So I'm out there in the trenches, just like you guys are. And I just I want to say thank you. I know how busy things are these days um, for you taking the time out of your day to join us here today. So as mentioned, I am in Eastern Ontario, Canada, um, and we are uh, kind of ground zero for Ontario as far as uh, ticks and Lyme disease are concerned. Um, we'll actually go to uh, the first slide here. Um, and and I'll start by giving a little bit of background. I when I grew up, I, um, I I had never seen a tick until I was in vet school, and never imagined that I'd be doing things like this. Um, had an opportunity um, in my first year of vet school, after my first year actually, to take a job uh, doing a, a a project, a summer project on Lyme disease um, in the Thousand Islands region. So that's where I am um, on the St. Lawrence River. Uh, just between upstate New York and Canada. Um, and so I had this opportunity, we trapped um, white-footed mice, anesthetized them and picked all the ticks off. So you can see that that's what we're doing in the picture here. Um, and in the lower left picture, you can actually see uh, there's about 10 larval ticks on that uh, mouse's ear. And uh, I learned what ticks look like very quickly. Um, the most we ever picked off of a mouse was 332 at one time. Um, and uh, we caught her again uh, a few months later and she had another 160. 68. So um, just just a, a crazy number of ticks that we would find down here. In fact, I always tell the story that one day I dropped a clipboard on the ground and I picked it up and there were 10 ticks on the clipboard just from dropping it. So we, we've got lots of ticks. Um, uh, and so uh, I ended up, um, that project worked out really well. The, the woman you see in the photo that's holding the mouse there, she's now my wife. So that was an added bonus from our, uh, our, our summer uh, project that we worked on. So um, uh, basically, I ended up uh, deciding that I wanted to live in the most endemic area for Lyme disease in Canada. And it's something I've been very passionate about talking about since um, and educating clients and then and then having the opportunity to do great events like this. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you all for tuning in. So um, we'll get started. I know we've got a lot to go through um, and I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So we're going to try and go th through this super fast and very high level stuff, but I hope that it's practical and things that you can apply and practice right away. So um, this 
This is a picture of the uh, first page of the consensus statement re released by the ACBIM in 2006. Um, it's been largely joked about as being uh, the non-consensus consensus statement. Um, there's very few things that the experts agree upon on how to deal with Lyme disease in practice, but the number one thing that they do agree about is that it is a preventable disease. And we believe that prevention is absolutely key and it's far better to focus on prevention than it is on treatment and what to do once an animal is positive. So um, what we use in our practice is what we call a three-pronged approach, starting with client education. We do these in order. So client education, using a, a preventive, and then possibly vaccinating uh, depending on lifestyle of the animal. And we do these in order because client education helps not only our, our our patients, but our clients as well. And I always say that I'm, I'm, I can prevent Lyme disease in, in my canine patients. I'm more worried about it um, in the humans uh, because they're living in the same environment and getting ticks and they may not know that much about um, how to prevent Lyme disease in themselves. So client education provides a, a broad net, then a, a preventive, will take care of not only black-legged ticks and obviously um, Borrelia, which is Lyme disease, but also other uh, tick-borne diseases as well as other tick species and other ectoparasites as well. And then vaccination is our narrowest net um, or in our kind of our final um, uh, our final safety net for um, our three-pronged approach. And when we do this, we, we, we do very well. And so what I would say um, is that you know, I, I see a lot of responses coming in from where you are that in geography is is a big factor on how much Lyme disease you have around. But I still argue that lifestyle of our patients largely is the biggest influencer here. I I mean, I would argue that there's every bit of as big a difference between a hunting lab um, and a little chihuahua that lives in a purse for what I would recommend for them. So not everybody in my practice gets all three of these. Um, certainly even a chihuahua that lives in a purse, um, you know, we're going to educate the clients because I'm still worried about them getting Lyme disease. And then I'm going to still use a preventive probably more for fleas than I am uh, uh, for anything else. And that dog's probably not getting a vaccine. But for most of our patients, they're getting all of these. But I, I, I absolutely always, I spend most of my time trying to educate my clients about it. So we'll go on to the next slide here. And um, we've had... Um, uh, the great opportunity to be part of a project over the last several years um, with uh, the University of Guelph. Um, and it was a, a three-year study on, on puppies. Um, and we enrolled them when they came in for their puppy exams. Uh, and we went three years uh, and these dogs were tested every year. We had more than 50 puppies um, and we had none of them test positive for Lyme disease. So this is a preventable disease. We didn't pick people that we thought were going to be compliant. We just spent a lot of time educating everybody and we ended up with zero positives out of it, uh, out of the three years that we did it. So it does work. So, um, so let's, uh, uh, let's head on to the next one. Um, and I always, I always joke about the three pronged approach that it's, it's not sexy or exciting or anything like that. I always joke that it's kind of like being a dentist and talking about flossing and brushing and saying, you know, you'll have fewer cavities. If you do those three things, you'll have less Lyme disease in your practice. And, and it's, it's the biggest thing that we focus on. So, um, there was recently a study released uh, that looked at um, veterinarians in Canada and their attitudes towards Lyme disease. And um, one of the things that shocked me in there was that, uh, that there was a, a vast percentage of veterinarians who said that they would not um, identify ticks in practice because they didn't feel that they could or they didn't feel they had time. And I would argue that every person in every vet clinic uh, in North America should be able to identify at least these four major genera of ticks. Um, and so really it's two questions you have to ask. Um, is the sputum, which is the, the dorsal shield on the tick, is it colored or not is the first question. And realistically, the two that you're, if you're in the Northeast or the upper Midwest, the two that you're mostly going to see are either dermacenter species or exodes. And so you've got dermacenter on the left, it has white modeled markings on its sputum. And then we have it on the right or kind of second from the right is the Ixodes scapularis um, and Ixodes species all have a just black uh, dorsal shield. The females are on the top, their sputum only covers part of their dorsum so that they can expand for a blood meal. But that's gonna be the vast majority of the ticks. And it's really, I always joke that it's as easy as black and white. And then 
If it's not one of those, you'll probably know. Um, if you've got a Lone Star tick, so Amblyomma americanum, it's got a single yellow or white spot at the dorsal aspect of, or the caudal aspect of the, the scutum for the female on the top, and then a lot the yellow markings along the festoons of the uh, 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 on the bottom there. And then the then Riphocephalus sanguineus is our brown dog tick. It's on the far right. Um, it has angled mouth parts, and if you zoom in on that, it kind of looks like a Darth Vader helmet. Um, and I always say that you know if you see this one i always get concerned because if you find this in a house um my concern is that th this tick all life stages can feed on a dog in quick succession and they can actually um, have an infestation within three to six months in a house um and you have to get fumigators in to get to get them out so um so these are the four it really is this easy. If you keep this flow chart or snap a, a photo of the screen, like it, it's this simple and everybody in the practice should be able to identify it. We, we do this as a, a free service to our clients is just identifying these ticks to give them an idea. And it's an opportunity to educate and increase that bond with the practice. So uh, let's go on to the next slide there. And so we'll start with the first, um, the first part of, of the three pronged approach, which is tick checks. And I, I argue that this is the most important part because it's the only part that helps humans and it is the only free part of this. And people always complain about the expense of doing preventives year round and, and vaccinating and coming in for exams. And I say that the most important part is that you do this and it's the free part. You're spending that quality time with your, your, your pet anyways. Spend some time feeling down their legs. Maybe they won't bite us when they come in for a nail trim. You know, all of this stuff, it, 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 you know, maybe you'll find a mass, maybe you'll find another dermatologic issue that, that, that needs to be addressed. So this is, this is the most important part. And it's important that we do this as humans as well and, and get the tick out as fast as possible. Um, use forceps uh, or, or, or like eyebrow tweezers. You can you grasp down close to the skin, pull up gently and firmly and pull it out. Um, I recommend you do this every day. If you're not doing it every day, you're probably not gonna do it if it's not part of your habitual routine. And the reason that we recommend doing it every day is that you've got about 24 hours for the, the tick to um, transmit Borrelia. And so if you're doing it every day and you've got 24 to 48 hours, you've got one, maybe two chances um, to pick up uh, the tick before it transmits. And I always say, you know, we, I recommend that any human, so any clients that we have, I recommend that they keep the ticks um, and, and that they keep them in either a Ziploc bag or in a container with some alcohol or something like that. That, that um, And that way they can take it to their human health pro, uh, healthcare provider if, they're, if they develop clinical signs. And I usually recommend that um, clients bring the ticks in for, for me to identify if, uh, if it's on their dog. And I haven't yet found many clients that wanna keep the ticks after that. So I usually keep them and I keep them in a little um, jar with alcohol and and what i what i try and do is then have different stages of engorgement uh different life stages so that i can show clients and make sure they're comfortable identifying them and i always joke that when you put them in a um uh, a little vial with alcohol it's it's like a little snow globe of ticks and if we go to the next slide you'll see that there was a a clinic that actually did this so if you're looking for some holiday decorating ideas here's one for you um that you can make a little snow globe for your uh front uh front uh, uh counter uh when people come back inside after covid so so um, we'll head on to the next slide here. And so in our practice, we started out initially, you know, we recommend tick checks um, all year. Uh, ticks will be out anytime that it's above freezing. Uh, you, the, the literature says 39 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius. Um, we usually find that it resonates better with owners if they're thinking about it anytime that it's above freezing. And um, we usually were, were recommending kind of March to November, but we were our, our most the most ticks we ever found in our practice were between December and February because people stopped using the preventive and anytime it warms up, we get bombarded with ticks. So we, we changed our tune. So I, I still hesitate to use a year round because people just think we're trying to get more money out of them. Um, usually what I say is that anytime it's above freezing, you should be using a preventive. And usually owners will then say, well, it's above freezing in all months of the year. And you say, yeah. And they're like, well, I guess we should use it pretty much year round. So my, my feeling has always been if it's minus 20 and three feet of snow on the ground, don't give the next dose. But if it's, if it's, you see in the long range forecast that it's going to warm up, go ahead and give the next dose because it's gonna do two things. You're gonna be preventing 
tick infestations in your dog, but you're also gonna be thinking about it for yourself that maybe you need to check um, yourselves for ticks as well. Um, and then for me, uh, vaccination um, is based on lifestyle and patient by patient risk assessment. And any animal spending a lot of time outdoors in the woods who are living in or traveling to endemic areas, I believe should receive all three of the three pronged approach above. And when we do it, we just don't see positive animals. I mean, you're not absolutely going to Lyme proof a dog. We know that nothing is 100% but it's gonna do the very best that you can. And we've had great results here. So uh, we'll head on to the next, uh, the next one. And, and this is just a very quick review of the life cycle of Exodus scapularis. Basically the adult female uh, falls off of a, you know, after taking a blood meal, usually from a white tailed deer, lays her eggs in the spring of the year and they hatch and they come out in huge numbers in July, August, and September. Now they don't carry Lyme disease. Um, they pick it up when they take their first blood meal. So they'll feed once at each life stage, um, usually on a white footed mouse. It has its Borrelia circulating in its bloodstream, picks it up, carries it to the next life stage and they'll emerge as nymphs. Nymphs are considered to be the highest risk to humans. They emerge in the spring of the following year. Um, usually May, June or July is our highest peak time. They're very small. This is one that's on me. Um, you can see I missed it on my evening tick check. I found it the next morning. Um, you can see it's already starting to engorge a little bit. And that's beside a Canadian dime, which is about the same size as an American dime. And those are my wife's eyebrow tweezers in the right. And you can see how monstrous they look. Um, these can carry Borrelia and they're considered to be the highest risk to humans uh, because of their small size and the fact that we spend more time out in May, June, and July when it's warmer and nicer weather and usually wearing less clothing. Um, and then they feed again, so they have a second chance to pick up Borrelia, usually on a white-footed mouse, and then they'll emerge as an adult from the kind of in the fall of the year through to the next spring, any time that it's above freezing. And they usually have about twice the, the percentage chance of carrying Borrelia. So in our study that we did in the Thousand Islands, we found 16% of the nymphs were carrying Borrelia and 31% of the adults. So roughly double, which we'd expect. And we find that the longer that the area is established, the, the more percentage chance that they carry it. And we do find places where it's up to 60, 80% of the ticks will be carrying it. So let's head on to the next slide here. Um, and this is probably where we'll spend most of our time. We're about halfway through here. Um, most of our time is, is talking about this because this is the part of the consensus statement. Um, you know, hopefully if we spend all of our, or most of our effort on preventing it, we won't need to be here with treating positive animals. Um, this is an area that there is no consensus on. Um, I think that most are comfortable that if we have a dog that is showing the classic symptoms and, and, and classic clinical signs associated with Lyme disease. So, you know, um, a shifting leg lameness, maybe some, uh, um, you know, we, we do see low grade fevers, um, uh, uh, some joint swelling. Um, and particularly we often will see the lameness closest to where the tick bit if if we have a history of known tick bites, but really the, some of the biggest things for me are like, if you've got vomiting or diarrhea, like I generally don't think of Lyme disease with those, with those dogs. The classic presentation is just that they are sick, suddenly low grade fever, Lyme positive, um, reluctant to move, lame, possibly shifting leg, leg lameness and possibly some lymph node enlargement in the area. That's our kind of classical clinical signs. Um, uh, no one's arguing that if you have that and you can't find anything else going on, we should treat that dog. The other one that um, in the in the consensus statement, you know, there's 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 a little more difficulty here is that if the dog is 40x positive, you can't find anything else in the in the dog it has is proteinuric, um, and we should be checking every dog for proteinuria. Um, if you have this and you can't find another cause of 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 you know kidney disease or renal dysfunction, then I think that it's appropriate to treat in that case as well. The one that becomes really controversial is what do we do with those dogs that we have um, that are positive but are totally fine? They've shown up for their annual exam and vaccines, um, totally non-clinical, and they have um, and, and they're Lyme positive on their annual screening test. What do we do with those guys? And um, in the recent uh, um, consensus statement four of the six authors feel that no treatment is indicated, but two of the six authors feel that you should treat every one of those dogs. So that leaves us as practitioners in a pretty tough spot. And so 
I basically present what's known in the literature to my clients and we make a decision together on whether we're going to treat or not. Now, we do not have them come in for an annual vitamin D prescription and get their doxycycline every year. That's not what we're talking about. Usually what we do, and I'll get to this in the next couple of slides, is that we will recommend um, that if they treat their dog, they get to treat it one time. And then what we do is we put them on a rock solid prevention program going forward. And I've presented this slide um, for the last five years now. And at uh, NAVC or VMX now, I have a long line of people come up and tell me how irresponsible I was for not treating every animal uh, that tested positive because they would become clinical, they may get Lyme nephritis, and I could have prevented this. Um, and then on the other hand, I also presented this a few weeks after that, and I had a lady tell me that I was going to kill all of the children in the world with the superbugs I was creating with my inappropriate use of doxycycline, um, and that I was doubly immoral because I was making a profit while prescribing these antibiotics. So um, as you can see, there, there's, there's really, you know, really passionate uh, arguments on either side of this. And this is the tough spot. There is no consensus on what to do here. So I'm going to go through in the next few slides what I do to try and make sure that I present this to the owners and they get to make a decision. And I have some people who decide they don't want to spend the money on doxycycline. They think their dog is fine. They're going to monitor and that's fine, that's totally appropriate with the consensus statement. On the other hand, if you've got a, a, a person who has a, you know, a golden retriever and is terrified of Lyme nephritis, we don't know for sure that we're gonna prevent it by treating. The most important thing is going to be that we, we get them on a rock solid prevention pro protocol so that we don't get them repeatedly exposed. And, and this slide here um, is, is looking at um, a collection of studies, Dr. George Moore, who's on the consensus statement, who feels is one of the people who feels that we should treat dogs. Um, uh, he, he provided this slide to me and I'm thankful to him. And, and this is uh, just a list of studies that are out there that show joint lesions that are beyond what would be normally expected in dogs, um, who have tested positive for Lyme and, um, and, and are clinically asymptomatic, uh, but yet have these joint lesions of, of more inflammation around the joints that, that wouldn't be expected or is, is more so than what would be in the control dogs. Um, and so we do see inflammation around the joints. And one of the things is our, our, even if they do, if they are achy, um, you know, what we don't know is if that dog is seven or eight years old and or is it arthritis or is it possibly Lyme disease um, that is exacerbating that? And so I, I I always present this to my clients and I leave it up to them on what we decide we're going to do. So let's go on to the next slide here. Um, and this is the picture from the original consensus statement. And for the most part, this is still what is, is considered to be accepted. Um, this is from the 2006 one, but even in 2018, there's really not much that has changed. So as you can see, if they're asymptomatic, they recommend no treatment. But the most important thing, and as I mentioned already, check for proteinuria and educate the owner. I, like, I, I really think that these are, I absolutely agree that these are the most important things. Um, what I, and consider co-infections, especially, you know, um, with anaplasma, we know that are transmitted by the same ticks. We know that those, that dogs that have anaplasma, uh, they're anaplasma positive and Borrelia positive um, are, are more likely to show clinical signs. And so um, what you will see down here, uh, what I want to point out on this slide is you'll see that the QC6 is only recommended in dogs that are simply symptomatic and when you're treating. And I'm going to talk about that on, in the next couple of slides here. So let's go on to the next one. And um, so these are the priorities uh, that I have um, in practice. So number one, as I mentioned, what we do in our practice is as soon as a dog tests positive, we send them right outside to, to collect a urine sample and we include that. That is that is for free, um, I suppose, though we have just you know added a couple bucks to our 4DX test um, and it covers all the urine test strips you'll ever have. This was taken from Dr. Richard Goldstein, who is on the consensus statement as well. And his recommendation was that if you, um, if you take them outside, you get a urine sample, you check it, and on the dipstick, it tests positive for, for protein, um, they're going to be far more likely to be willing to pay to send out a year protein creatinine ratio. If you've already charged them for a UA and then you want to do another test and then you want to just keep adding tests and, and treatments, the, the costs just start to add up. And so that's that's been a really useful tip for us um, in getting people to buy into this. And so we the dipstick costs pennies to the clinic. And like we said, we just go out, we collect a urine sample. And if it tests positive, we strongly recommend sending it for a UPCR. And to me, those are the number one and number two things. Then what we've got to do is talk about tick prevention and implement a protocol. As I said, public health, 
start a preventive. And then if they're asymptomatic and non-proteinuric, I have no problem vaccinating that animal and starting that vaccine that day, because it's not going to be immunotherapy. It's not going to, you know, treat what they've got currently going on. The issue is going to be that, that they're going back out into the same environment and we want to prevent them from getting future exposures. So then, as I mentioned, I'll talk about the current literature that's out there. I'll talk about the consensus statement and what the recommendations are, and we'll decide whether we're going to treat or not. And only once I've done that, will I then talk about doing a QC6. I always joke about this. If we had universal health care for every pet, I do this every single time. The issue is we haven't found a, a client yet that has infinite money to spend. And so um, I try and do this in, 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 in a logical order. I hate hearing about patients who have, they've performed the QC6 and they've spent money on treatment and then they have no money left over to, to do prevention. And, and really that's the thing that's the most important. So um, let's go to the next slide and I'll just talk about the QC6 really quickly. Um, I do think it's extremely useful, but it is a titer and it needs to be done twice for it to be useful. So the only reason you're gonna do it twice is if you do it initially before treatment and then six months later to recheck to make sure that it's come down with treatment. So that's going to demonstrate that we are successful in our treatment and that we don't have re-exposure. And that's going to be very important for us to, to see that um, you know there's been compliance with our, our program um, and with our antibiotic treatment as well. Um, and I say, uh, ideally this should be performed anytime treatment is instituted because then you can use that new baseline um, to, to tell if they've been re-exposed. And what we what we think is successful treatment is if we see a 50% reduction in the QC6. So if it goes from 300 to 150, even though it's still above that critical threshold of 30 uh, units per milliliter, um, you know, we've seen a 50% reduction. And so now that new baseline, if you just test it afterwards and you see that it's 150, you're probably just gonna keep on treating that dog and you're gonna have trouble bringing it down much further. And so that's probably where their baseline is going to be for the future. So that those are the three things you get by doing it. You see that you have successful treatment, you see that there's been compliance and not re-exposure. And then we also see that there's, um, uh, uh, we have a baseline for the future. So what it doesn't do is it does not predict illness. So if you have a, um, a, a, a dog with a titer of 500 versus a dog with a titer of 32, that dog with a 500 titer is no more likely to develop clinical signs than the one with 32. It, it's just not. So it doesn't predict illness. It really detects the robustness of the, the host immune response. And so it, it doesn't it doesn't tell us anything. So we can't use it for that. And so people, uh, I often get the question, well, I have a dog that has a titer of 30, uh, of 300 and it's not symptomatic. Should I treat that dog? And my answer is I, I, you've got the question wrong. I would be treating that dog because I would have been deciding to treat it before I did the titer. Um, and then I always recommend um, uh, not doing it until you've done a urine dipstick, talked about tick control and, and treatment because just, just for the money reason. Um, and so those are my, those are my tips on, on dealing with this in practice. And um, let's go to the last slide or the next slide here, just about, you know, if we're treating, implement that three-pronged approach to drastically reduce this need to treat. And that's the best way to decrease our antimicrobial use. I mean, we should be very cognizant of this. And I do agree with the, the lady that we, should, we shouldn't be just handing out doxycycline to everybody. And the best way to do that is to prevent this in the first place. Always check for proteinuria and emphasize the risk of re-exposure in positive dogs and the family members as well. Um, and use a QC6 to monitor your treatment and pro prevention program efficacy and determine a new baseline for future exposures. And then I just, please don't blindly treat every blue dot, have a discussion with them, educate them, um, and, and don't send the antibiotics without a prevention program. And I, I tell people that, hey, you've got one chance at this. If you don't do the prevention protocol, like, I, and your dog gets re-exposed, I mean, I, I'm not sending doxycycline every year. Uh, we're just not doing that. And so um that that kind of wraps up the uh the main part on on uh, uh my practical approach i know that's super fast and kind of high level but the last thing i just wanted to mention and we were talking about this just before we came on the air here that um you know this is a tough time um COVID burnout's a real thing and uh you know it's a tough job we're heading into the busiest season here um you know i always recommend that you guys uh um in in our this is this is a team approach um i always say that you know nothing slows down our our 
parasite prevention uh, sales uh, faster than so, uh, you know someone on the front desk who, who isn't bought into this. This is a team approach. We should sit down as a as a clinic and go through what our approach is for par parasitology in general, and you know take a chance or, or take the time to check in with each other. We're all we're all on the same team here. We're all uh, going through a, a tough time with curbside and everything like that, and it's just been such a crazy busy time. Check in with each other, take care of each other, and uh, um, and with that, I've just got a few conclusions here and we'll wrap it up. Um, as I mentioned off the top, it's a preventable disease. Prevent, don't, don't, don't be reactive. Don't just treat positive cases, prevent it in the first place. Use that three pronged approach with the tick checks, use of an approved carousel and, um, and vaccination to prevent Lyme positivity. Uh, don't just treat the blue dots, use a syst systematic approach to work up Lyme positive asymptomatic cases and determine your clinic's Lyme prevention strategy as a team to ensure maximum client compliance. So uh, with that, Thank you guys all so much. Um, and uh, I know that was super fast and I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that you guys have. So thank you all. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. We have a couple of great questions uh, that I see out there. Um, if you have any comments, please type them in. Uh, we'd like to pass that on uh, to the speaker and also to Merck Animal Health. Again, a huge shout out to Merck for sponsoring this YouTube live event. And uh, let's begin with a couple of questions. So the first question, what dose of doxy do you use? Do you use five mg per kg BID, 10 mg per kg SID? Do you use it for 10 days, 14 days? What are the general recommendations for the symptomatic sick uh, dog that does need antimicrobial therapy? Yeah, so I, I've usually used um, the, 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 the consensus statement usually recommends the 10 mg per kg SID um, for, for 30 days. And that's that's usually that's what we've done historically, yeah. And we've and, and realistically, what I always say is, if you have a symptomatic dog, um, and uh, if you have a symptomatic dog, uh, I would um, I would do it. Uh, I would recommend it. Like you should see that dog be like a hundred percent back to normal, unless of course we're talking about like a Lyme nephritis, which is a whole different uh, can of beans. I, I would say that if you've got a dog that is showing the classic presentation for Lyme disease, we we should see drastic improvement. They should be basically back to normal in 48 hours. And um, that's where I always emphasize to clients, continue, do the full month. Um, don't just stop because the dog did better. Now, there are the other recommendations you could use. Um, uh, uh, there's minocycline. Uh, there's also um, amoxicillin. I usually just go with the, the plums recommendation on that. Um, and then there's also um, uh, been a more recent report that you can use Convenia um, uh, two injections 14 days apart. Um, and usually like sometimes I'll, I'll use that for like the little dogs that where it's more affordable and they just like vomit like crazy on doxycycline. Um, that, that is an option for you, but I would go doxycycline every time and then go to one of the others if there's a concern uh, for something else. Great, great information, Scott. I'm also gonna reiterate, make sure we take the time to educate our pet owners on whether or not you are using an SID to BID. I don't dose it SID before they go to bed because then they're lying down. There could be heartburn, there could be esophagitis. I want them up. I want to make sure they're yep. getting that food immediately after. Remember, Absolutely. it doesn't work with dairy products. Um, yep. So make sure you're taking the time to educate pet owners. I'm also gonna reiterate the criticalist in me is just gonna say, please don't dispense it with NSAIDs. Okay, because Scott just mentioned, you should see a dramatic improvement in 24, 48 hours, these dogs should be 100% back to normal. And if they aren't, you're gonna mask that with a concurrent NSAID. So please no NSAIDs at the same time, because then I get referred the case and now I have to joint tap uh, because it's actually an IMJD, an immune mediated joint disease. So again, should be a dramatic improvement with that doxycycline. Yeah. Now, another question that I'm seeing out there and we're seeing a ton of people who are mentioning it's warm right now, we're seeing ticks. Um, is there any research that Borrelia or some of the other tick-borne diseases can be transmitted faster than 24 to 48 hours? And what should we do with that? Yeah, so um, so certainly um, some of the other, so anaplasma or lichia, um, I, I believe there's like three papers that have ever been done looking at, at transmission in our lichia, and they range from like six to 24 hours for, um, so my, my feeling on this is the faster you do your tick checks, the better. 
Um, I, I mean, I usually recommend that as soon as you come in from outside, you're, you're checking. Um, and certainly things like uh, Powassan virus in humans um, is a concern, certainly in the Northeast and in the upper Midwest. And we like it can be transmitted as quickly as 15 minutes to humans in particular. So um, my my feeling is the faster you can check, the better. We have a little bit more grace period for Lyme disease. And the thing is, is like, I hear all kinds of stories where like, well, if the tick like partially fed on someone else and, and or on some other animal got brushed off and then gets on you, it could, it could already be primed to have the Borrelia and the salivary glands and it could transmit faster. That's all true. I mean, I think that's probably rare, but I think the general feeling is number one, do your tick checks as fast as possible. And number two, using a preventive, um, they're pretty good, all of them at killing things pretty quickly now. Um, and we've got great products out there. So go ahead and use them. Um, and, and that's gonna help for our canine patients. Um, and then the other point, and I've seen a few comments coming up here, for the other tick-borne diseases, we aren't as lucky to have a vaccine, right? So that just puts more emphasis on, on doing tick checks regularly and using our preventives with compliance. Great information. Now, I wanted to reiterate, please keep in mind that thanks to generous support from Merck, this is on YouTube free forever on the internet. So if your colleagues miss it, they can certainly watch it again. You want to watch it again? Absolutely. But remember, CE is only available if you watch it live, which means you must fill out that little link that I just posted right there in the tiny URL. You have to do it within the next 30 minutes in order to get your CE. If you fill it out in 31 minutes, we're really sorry, but we don't have proof that you watched it live. So you have to fill it out in order to get your CE certificate. And again, a huge thank you to Merck for making this available to everyone. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. Scott for fantastic information. I just wanted to reiterate the great point that you brought up, proteinuria. That dipstick is so important. And, you know, we also, we often think, eh, you know, the urinated, we, we forget to um, utilize that liquid gold. But Again, that evidence of proteinuria warrants treatment. So please be aware of that. Seeing some great questions about uh, Quant C6 and some great comments about being able to get to a uh, Quant C6 uh, with your IDEX test. So when in doubt, talk to your, um, whoever you're using for diagnostics. But um, Scott, any last tips you wanna leave when it comes to proteinuria? What if it's like one plus with a urine source <laughs> of a gravity of 1050 versus three plus with like 1018? Sure. When sure. do we decide to treat? Yeah, and, and you know, that's a great point um, that I, I didn't mention here, uh, just trying to get through it fast. Um, I always do a specific gravity, obviously, with it because a one plus protein means a lot different if it's uh, 1008 versus 1050 plus, right? Um, so <laughs> what I would say is, do we end up doing a UPCR in every animal that has a trace protein of 1050, like with a USG of 1050? No, but but my my job is to educate the owners and give them the option and, and say, hey, we've got this, you know, I do find that generally if we have a trace and it's over... 1050 and i mean especially if you've got some alkaline urine for whatever reason i mean i do find that we we often find that that upcr comes back in the normal range but i don't know that for sure it's a screening test right so my job is to give that recommendation and then and then you know i support my clients with whatever they choose to do with that uh, certainly if it's 1008 and three plus protein I'm, I'm wanting to work that up not only for lyme disease but for other reasons as well right and so um and and i, I saw the question come in just about you know why do i go to that i mean that is the recommend like our biggest concern with lyme disease right is that they're going to develop lyme nephritis that's going to be our life-threatening form of lyme disease and and often fatal form of Lyme disease. And so for me, you know, we want to, we don't know for sure what the path, uh, what the pathophysiology uh, is of this and what the, what the clinical course looks like. Are they proteinuric for a while before? And do we have an opportunity to prevent it before it presents in that a, possibly acute on chronic um, situation where we can't get them back? So we recommend checking for proteinuria first. Um, and then especially if they're asymptomatic otherwise, and if they are symptomatic, we also wanna check it to make sure they're not gonna go into this you know, imminently here. Um, and so I would say check for proteinuria first, um, include it in, in, and that's consistent with the consensus statement, um, and then talk about treatment and then the QC6, just because the number doesn't tell you anything unless you're already planning on treating it, because if you get a, a QC6 of 300, and you haven't 
discuss treatment, I mean, what are you going to do with that number? It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything unless you're going to recheck it in six months. And the only reason you recheck it in six months is if you're going to treat. So that's why I don't jump to QC6 right away. So yeah. All right, great information. Sounds like we'll have to have a future YouTube live just on the importance of your analysis or what we call liquid gold. Um, <laughs> I'm also, I'll leave this note and just say, when in doubt, a UA, a screening UA is such an important part of an annual exam, especially for geriatric patients. I'd rather do that than a fecal because most of your patients um, <laughs> are on dewormers, right? But like really educate your CSR and your staff to make sure that pet owners are bringing a first morning urine sample that they collect as part of the routine annual exam. It's so important. Uh, Dr. Jody Lulich will give me a pat on the back at University of Minnesota <laughs> for that. <laughs> uh, again, liquid gold. Again, Dr. Scott, amazing presentation. Thank you guys all for attending. I know you guys are all really busy. And again, a huge shout out and thank you to Merck. Uh, please make sure to uh, thank your Merck rep the next time you see them uh, in person once uh, COVID is over. Uh, make sure to wash your hands, mask up, and hopefully we'll all get vaccinated and be protected soon. And with that, thank you guys all for joining and we will see you at the next event. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.